So I'm teaching from John 9 today, which is the lectionary passage for today, the fourth Sunday in Lent. And I just thought this is so fun. Uh, we're going to read the entire chapter because like chapters 7, 8, and 9 in John are kind of like make this one solid narrative where he's the, the feast of tabernacles is taking place in Jerusalem. And there is a whole bunch of hubbub around Jesus, because he is kind of already famous, or perhaps infamous. He has already um, healed the crippled man by the pool of Bethesda on a Sabbath. I think I taught from that maybe six months ago or so, and that got him in all kinds of trouble with all kinds of people. Uh, The Feast of Tabernacles is a big deal. If we, I mean, if we think of today, we have our Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving. Tabernacles is top three for sure for the nation of Israel. Lots of people come to Jerusalem. And so everybody is wondering, will Jesus be coming to Jerusalem? But they're wondering this quietly because the Jewish leaders have already been plotting how to get rid of Jesus And the word has been spreading that if you become a Jewish follower of Jesus, you will be kicked out of your synagogue and banned. So it's kind of like nobody nobody like wants to be publicly like known to be intrigued about Jesus, but like everybody is intrigued about Jesus. You could draw any number of parallels to that. Are you deconstructing in your faith? Oh my goodness. Wow, you're asking deep questions. (gasps) Don't tell anybody. So uh, we're, from the beginning of um, John 7, Jesus' brothers, it seems, are telling him, look, no one knows who you are. You should go up to Jerusalem. But it kind of seems like it's tongue-in-cheek because it, it, the text explicitly says they did not believe in him. His own flesh and blood or cousins or we don't know exactly what, how we understand Jesus' relationship to his brothers and sisters, but... They don't believe. Jesus does go up to believe up, up to Jerusalem. John uses language like that he went in secret, as it were. And uh, chapter seven and eight kind of deal with a big kerfuffle with Jesus arriving in Jerusalem and getting into all kinds of conversations and debates. The religious leaders trying to stone him to death, him sneaking away, uh, as well as the famous story of the woman caught in adultery and how Jesus treats her and dignifies her. And all of her accusers are sent away. So all of that has just happened. Gotcha? That's where we're at. John chapter 9. Now as we, let's see if this still works. As we read this, I'm going to read it out to you. And I've got the text up on slides here so that uh, we can follow along. Pay attention for the, the things that John, the writer, is comparing. Sight versus blindness. The big story here in John 9 is the guy when Jesus spits in the, in the mud, right? This is one of my favorite stories and it has stuck with me since I was a kid. It's just so weird. Why? Like in other cases, Jesus has just opened people's eyes. Sometimes he tells them to go swim in a pool. In this one, it's a whole mixture of everything. He spits in the dirt, makes mud, puts it in the guy's eyes, then tells the guy to go and bathe. So just pay attention for some of these kinds of things. Who's in, who's out, who sees, who's blind, who's labeled a sinner, who's not labeled a sinner. Just pay attention to those things because there's a lot of interesting and frankly funny things happening in this story. So, uh, as he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, so that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Now, it's kind of implied here that the other people have ignored this man. And who sees him? Jesus. It's one of our first things. Jesus saw the man. He notices him. And the disciples kind of just like, they kind of objectify the man and use him like a rhetorical device. They don't seem to care that he's blind. They're just kind of like, hmm, what can we learn from this? 
Was it perhaps his fault or his parents' fault? Like, who sinned? Like, they don't, like, that's not very caring. Like, like it's more or less like a theological exercise. Oh, an opportunity. Excellent. Jesus, teach us. Uh, well, okay. So Jesus says this man never sinned, which is, should give us pause for a minute anyway. And his parents didn't sin. Like, this is all weird right from the get-go. I don't think we should draw conclusions like the man lived a sinless life. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. But, but, but Jesus is saying, you guys have no clue what's going on here. <laughs> like, no clue. Um, and I, I used to read it, when I was a kid, I loved the story, but I felt a little troubled. Like, maybe God is also objectifying this man. Like, God's works are going to be revealed in him, great. But it took a long time. And he had a really crappy life until that day came. Yeah. Like, that doesn't seem fair. Like, if that's like, well, you know, God, the ends, God's ends justify the means. And so, too bad for those 30 hard blind years. I don't think that's actually what's happening here. Yeah. And it's not actually what the text says. The text just says that God's works might be revealed. If... Uh, if we were all born blind, in some, not physical blindness, but a spiritual, a blindness of the heart, the inability to see truth, then the promise is God's works will be revealed in us too. So that's good news. If you are blind, you have to trust. And so the works of God have been revealed in this man's life, probably all along, every day, the presence of God guiding him, sustaining him, getting him to this point, where for whatever reason, he's been kind of cast off by his family, but he's still alive. He's find, found ways to live and survive and be fed. God's works have been revealed and are continuing and are about to be again in a new way revealed in him. Which is... I think, again, what the whole story is about, trust, waiting. It's, it's the foolish and lowly way of trust, confounding the wise and self-righteous, as we shall shortly see. Jesus says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles included this amazing event called the illumination of the temple. There in Jerusalem were four, not one, four massive menorahs, can candelabras, that were uh, 75 feet tall. So they're huge. Four of them placed around the city, around the temple, that were lit during the Feast of Tabernacles, that would give light to the entire city. They were so big in order to remind the people of a pillar of fire that guided them in the wilderness. And what does Jesus say in the midst of this festival? I am the light of the world. Isn't that wild? Yeah. He says it in John 8 in greater depth, but he's saying it, he's repeating himself here in John 9. I am the light of the world. And he's saying it to the man and his disciples who are listening, right? This is right where he is. So when he had said this, I am the light of the world, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva, as one does, and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go, wash your dirty mud eyes in the pool of Siloam which means sent. Then the man, he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it is someone pretending. Is someone like him? He kept saying, I am he. <laughs> but they kept asking him, how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? 
He said, I do not know. <laughs> Remember, the man has not seen Jesus at any point here. He was blind, and then he went to wash. And when he came back, there's no mention of where Jesus is. And everyone else is like, how did you see? And he's like, well, there was mud and bathing. Like everyone is, is actually so stuck on this that they're objectifying the man too. They've just seen the wildest thing happen. And there's no word of celebration, no word of congratulation, no praising God. It's, well, how did this happen though? But are you really that guy? I think it's someone else pretending. <laughs> There's not enough beggars. We need more look-alike beggars to pretend to be beggars because begging seems to be such a sweet gig here in Jerusalem. So, of course, they went and got the Pharisees, the wise people who would know what's up. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Oh, great. <laughs> Jesus, this guy. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes. Then I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, referring to Jesus, is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. <laughs> Cut and dry. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner, referring again to Jesus, perform such signs? And they were divided. They have, they have just witnessed a miracle that, it, to our understanding, has never happened before. There is no record before this one of any blind eyes ever being opened. This is the first time it's ever happened. And it's like, well, I, but it was on the Sabbath. Right? It's like that person, you know, there was some good prophetic words earlier, but they were delivered by a woman. Like, this is the level of absurdity that is happening here. Yeah, yeah. They've witnessed the wildest, like, first time miracle. And it's like, well, yeah, but Sabbath, but I mean, Jesus seems to be a sinner. Like, is he a sinner? We don't know. So uh, this, like, my question is, who's blind now? Mm. Right? They are literally refusing to see what is in front of their eyes because it doesn't fit the mold of what they expect to see in front of their eyes. Yeah. I mean, I get it. It's weird. Even the mechanics of how it happened is weird. No question. Um, but like this happens to us. Like has this happened to you? Like has, has God done something kind of cool in your life and then you've gone to tell everybody with celebration and joy and they said to you, yeah, well, that should have been more like this. Or maybe, maybe you're just like, yeah, that's cool, but like 15% tweak, it would be better like this. Like I'm literally sharing my story. Like this guy has done nothing but share the truth so far. <laughs> He's not added any details. He's like, oh, now I can see. <laughs> so this, this is the thing that happens. And I mean, it happens to us, I think. So on the other side, too, where we see things that, that God seems to be at work with people that we don't think he should be at work with. So both sides are here. So they said to the blind man, what do you say about him? Him being Jesus. It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. That was the catch-all option for people doing great things. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? I mean, now the skepticism is being cast around everywhere. This, is, this has been a very long con, basically. <laughs> is, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? Well, his parents said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes, but we stand by him. We love him. He is our son. Nope. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. Yeah. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said of him, said he is of age, ask him. Didn't exactly back him up, did they? The very people that, that maybe could come and vouch for us, he is the man he says he is. He's not an imposter. And they're kind of like, well, yeah, he is our son, but like bare minimum relational commitment being displayed here. 
So for the second time, they called the man who had been born blind. This is the Pharisees and the Jews. And they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Referring to Jesus. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Like for this guy, it's very not complicated. (laughs) They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? Like this cracks me up. Like, I don't know if this guy has a sense of humor or if like he's totally just like genuine. Like what other possible reason could they have for quizzing me over and over and over and over again? Maybe they were, maybe they would like to become Jesus' disciples. And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple. This is like when someone says, you're stupid. And you say, your mom's stupid. This is literally, literally what's happening here. He's like, do you guys want to become them? And they're like, you're his disciple. This man is not Jesus' disciple. They are just trying to insult him the best way they know how. You are his disciple. But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Again, referring to Jesus. The man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a, blind, of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Like this is a pretty solid summary I mean, we don't know this guy's religious upbringing, but he seems to know his scripture, and he's certainly got a mind capable of connecting the dots. What's interesting here, too, that um, we know that God has not listened to sinners. If you read it in the, the same passage in the Amplified Bible, they add, the writers of the Amplified add, we know according to your tradition that God does not listen to sinners. So I don't really know why one's translated one way and one's a different way. But I think that's very interesting. The implication that the Pharisees have spread this tradition in the first place of who God listens to and who God doesn't listen to. So this guy, this guy, who Jesus, what did Jesus say about the man? Regarding who had sinned? Jesus said he had not sinned, nor had his parents, right? And so, get this, this is great. This is the Pharisee's response to his pretty decent and reasonable uh, summary. You were born entirely in sins, and you're trying to teach us? And they kicked him out of the synagogue. Mm. Like, that is an intense reaction. People who are hurting are still turning up in religious communities and being told it doesn't look right and being sent away. That is still, unfortunately, a thing that happens. That is a thing many of us may have experienced at some times in our life. And sometimes maybe the sending away is something that we've sometimes contributed to. It doesn't happen because we're mean-hearted. It happens because we're afraid and we don't understand what's before our eyes. we're invited to see ourselves here as the blind man and as the Pharisees. Sometimes we're, sometimes we're either one. Like, it's confusing and scary and we don't always understand what's going on. We want something predictable and understandable. So, this has all happened. The man's been healed. The dialogue's taken place. And he's been driven out. So Jesus goes and finds him. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, which implies some searching, when he had found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. Well, this man has not seen Jesus until this moment, at least not with his physical eyes. But the eyes of that man's heart, some kind of spiritual eyes, had seen 
Jesus already and had connected the dots, had been able to explain this stuff to the Pharisees. And Jesus is now standing before him, right? It's just, just, just in that, to me, there's so much. Jesus knows this man has never seen what he looks like, so he cannot come and find Jesus. So Jesus goes and finds him. You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Come on. The Greek is like he prostrated himself. He lay down before Jesus. Yeah. Oh, man. And Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. And you're like, what? That sounds really weird. I mean, Jesus is is referring to the Pharisees, but he's also referring to every single human being. And notice that when his judgment, Jesus' judgment, it's not like, like, like when we see that word judgment, there's a part of me that goes like, oof, great, gross. But Jesus' judgment is not violent or aggressive. It's just truth-telling. It's just revealing injustice, exposing truth, and revealing our need for transformation, everybody's need for transformation. That's right. yeah. Now get this. Some of the Pharisees who were with him, because they seemed to hang around, said to him, well, sure, surely, surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were born blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. That is bonkers. So here's the question. If you were born blind, what would you have to do? Especially if you lived 2,000 years ago. You would have to trust, right? A lot of people and God. If you claim to be able to see we can see that here as self-righteousness. Yeah. Right? What is this? In Adam and Genesis 1, Adam and Eve, they took from the fruit, their eyes were opened, yeah. and they saw. But it was not the kind of sight that they should have had. Yeah. When we claim to see, when we claim to understand, to have it all figured out, yeah. Jesus is saying we've got it wrong. When we blindly and simply trust God, even when it seems to break the rules, yet another healing on the Sabbath, this one involving the making of mud, all the bricklayers were like, well, we make mud. We're not allowed to do it on the Sabbath. (laughs) When we blindly trust, we are led by the Good Shepherd. We are found wandering wherever it is we are, by the good shepherd, and then we are led, 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 led. The ones who, this is so so funny to me, like like the ones who see in this story, see blindness as the problem. That's the issue. Man's born blind. Someone must have sinned. It's like a click, click, click in their head. And they're so uh, unaware of all the ways that they are failing to see themselves and those around them. Um, yeah. Jesus opens that man's eyes physically, explaining him to, to him who he really is. Meanwhile, the, uh, the Pharisees who are right there, whose eyes physically work just fine, still can't see who Jesus is. And if you go back and read John 7 and 8, Jesus has like systematically laid out the promises one after the next and who he is. And it is mind-boggling to me. I mean, I get it. Like, it's mind-boggling when you read the story. It's mind-boggling when you read the story. You're like, how can these guys not get it? But obviously not getting it is the story of most of my life. Like, to this day, right? I'm like, oh, I thought I had so perfected this one area until Monday, and I start all again. <laughs> but listen to this. This is this, this man. I'm going to read this one to you. Um, 
These Pharisees were doing the best they could with what they knew, yes. And they really should have known better. And this is what their scriptures say. You ready? Close your eyes if you want. And just picture, if you can for a minute, hold in your head some of the things that Jesus has just done. Doing these amazing miracles, dignifying people, transforming them, setting them free. Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 9. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth and the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison who sit, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, see, the former things have come to pass, and